Hey, everybody. Okay, so um, hello and welcome to the Peer Workforce Conference, Bridging Research and Practice. I'm Billy and I'm with SHARE. The session is entitled uh, SHARE Collaborative Housing. Uh, if you would like a certificate for attending this presentation, please put your name and email in the chat. Uh, today's presenters are Tom uh, Habercorn and Sarah Gabriel. All of the sessions at today's events are being recorded and will be available at a later time. If you have any questions or technical problems, please send me a note directly in the chat. Everyone, please mute yourself now and remain muted unless you have been called upon to speak. At the end of the presentation, we ask that you please complete a short evaluation of today's talk. That's actually not, not uh, taking place anymore. Um, for this presentation, we ask that you raise your use the raise hand function to ask a question. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Tom and Sarah. Hey there. Uh, thank you, uh, Billy. Appreciate it. It's good to see some familiar faces on here um, as well. Um, thanks for coming to our presentation about share collaborative housing and um, so it's me, uh, Tom, and then we also have Sarah. Sarah is, um, who's going to be speaking in a little bit. She is our, I guess you would call her the supervisor of our peer bridgers. She's the peer bridger coordinator. And uh, she is a success story in itself, uh, a major success story for shared collaborative housing. And then uh, this particular presentation, I did put a PowerPoint. Uh, I like to give people some talking paper to take with them, you know, if you will. Um, so I copied and pasted it into this chat. Um, I don't typically for a presentation like this just uh, present it. I'm, you know, you guys are not funders or any of the agencies. Um, this is more going to be an informal type presentation, but I do want you, if you want to have something to take with you, please free, feel free to uh, get it from the chat. Um, so what is shared collaborative housing? Um, it is a it is what we would call our solution, one of a many solutions to homelessness. Um, and the idea that we have is that, um, and where the peers come into play is that housing people is not enough. We need to immerse people in an environment, a living environment that helps them recover from the various traumas that contributed to their being home, their, uh, finding themselves homeless in the first place. And so what we do to that extent is we partner with private homeowners, people that own uh, single family homes, detached single family homes, rental homes, all throughout Los Angeles County. Um, and basically, it kind of goes like this. The homeowner partner, if they agree to do our program, they would furnish the house all the way down to the knives, the forks, the spoons, the uh, provide cable television. Um, I used to say colored televisions, like I'm living back in 1959 or something, uh, cable televisions, and also importantly, computers with high speed internet. We have a very extensive um, furnishing list um, um, that it sometimes is not, it's not overwhelmingly expensive, but it is quite a bit, very, very detailed stuff like ice cream scoopers and uh, gravy boats and things like that. Um, and the reason that we get that detailed about down to that level is because we want to treat people with dignity um, just seeing somebody walk into a house in a beautiful neighborhood beautifully furnished uh, that they couldn't otherwise live in without pooling resources with other housemates and seeing all the detail that the landlord provides um, even down to those all the utensils and the cooking and baking uh, pots and pans and trays um, people get emotional because somebody actually cares about them. You know, they're, they're, uh, we want them to have dignity and it's emotional for me when we open a brand new house and somebody's moving in for the first time. Um, so the landlord, you know, follows all that and we are committed to being a low barrier housing source for people. So the landlord, uh, the homeowner partner, we call them, um, they agree to lower, uh, most of the barriers to housing that people have which are they can't afford a security deposit. So the, the homeowner agrees not to charge a security deposit. They can't uh, usually afford uh, you know, these expensive rents uh, in the housing market today. So that's why the share collaborative uh, housing format basically is people sharing 
uh, living like roommates, almost like in a college dorm. And uh, there's two people per room. Um, there's no, um, you know, credit checks or anything like that, serious background checks. Um, that's not going to hamper you from getting into a house. Um, even people that are, say, on what's called um, the 290 registry, uh, uh, sex offenders who have a difficult time finding housing anywhere, maybe they've done something in their past 10, 20 years ago. Um, we also, you know, we just notify them if there's any, um, if they do disclose that to us, uh, if there's anything like a church or a school or a school or a park within whatever a thousand feet of the uh, the house. And so um, the uh, peer, all the people that we house have the ability to pay the rent some way, and they have to be able to live independently, meaning they, if they can't live independently, if they need like a nurse to come in and provide care for them an hour or two every day, they wouldn't be a fit for our house. So, um, and the way that they pay the rent is uh, a lot of people have jobs. A lot of people have uh, what's called SSI, Social Security Supplemental Income. Um, and they pay directly out of that. And many people, um, especially as share collaborative housing has been growing and we have contracts with a lot of uh, either county supervisors or LA city councilmen or councils of governments that cover vast areas of uh, uh, cities, uh, city managers coalescing together. Um, there are programs that we have and then there are programs throughout the county where people will be provided rental assistance in which they pay the landlord directly uh, every month, um, their rent or a big portion of the rent. Um, and one of uh, an example of something like that, and one of my favorite programs at SHARE is called Gateway Cities Home to Employment Program. Just to give an example how somebody can have little or no income and get into our housing, we typically look for people for that program if they're homeless experiencing homelessness in one of what's called the gateway cities. It's basically cities in the southeast part of Los Angeles County that are not part of city LA, so city of LA. So you have uh, going from Signal Hill to Long Beach down south, all the way up through Cerritos, uh, Hawaiian Gardens, Paramount, uh, Downey, all those cities out there uh, up through Whittier, Pico Rivera, all the way up to East LA, Montebello. Um, and we look for people in that contract that are really, really eager to get a job. Uh, they may just need a lending hand on getting into housing because it's impossible to find a job pretty much when you're homeless, living in a car, living in a tent by a riverbed. You have no place to shower. You have no consistent access to uh, an internet. You have no confidence in your interviewing skills. Um, so those are the people that we look for. Um, and we will give them a helping hand that they let us help them find a job. And that contract has us partnering with two Los Angeles County Workforce Development Agencies, um, one in the southern part of that district and one in the northern part of that district. And uh, we connect them to them and they get their own employment case manager. We house them pretty much the same day. We enroll them uh, within the first couple of days in one of these employment agencies. Um, and it's great. It's like having your own agent, uh, your own employment case manager, uh, sitting down with you, going over your short-term goals, your long-term goals, uh, um, what you think, what is it, what are your goal, your own goals for your life, not what your family told you or your ex-wife or your ex-husband told you you should be doing. And this all goes along nicely with what our peer bridgers do as people move into the house from, from anywhere. And um, it's about helping people uh, live independently, supporting them to live independently in their own um resiliency uh as opposed to trying to manage their lives as an outside authority figure trying to force other people's goals on them and so for that contract as long as they stay engaged uh with their employment case manager they're going on the interviews they're doing the workshops they're doing the job coaching um we uh help pay their rent for the first six months six months in a row and then uh our goal our job is to make sure they're connected to a job they're saving some money and eventually people that are successfully quote unquote graduating through that program end up moving into their own little studio apartments or they'll find out their own market rate apartment with a coworker that they've met at work that they get along with. So um, that's a way that people can pay rent any number one of uh, rental assistance programs. And we're expert at share at connecting people to ways to pay their rent if they if they are not able to.
And our goal is always to get them to be rent self-sufficient um, within the first six months or so, or earlier than that. So that's kind of what the houses look like. Again, these are single family detached homes. There's a front yard and a backyard. They're beautifully furnished. We go to all neighborhoods. We try to give people kind of a if there is such a thing anymore, a middle class type of experience, uh, a lot of people, you know, they want to get away from maybe they've been living all their lives in high density, low income apartment units, or maybe they grew up in that kind of a thing. And we're looking for a more, uh, that's why we we really love our houses that are in really nice suburban neighborhoods. And yes, we do have houses on the west side also, which is expensive. Um, and those are beautiful as well. So um we go all throughout LA County, every part of Los Angeles County with, the, with our houses. And so that kind of explains the housing program, two people per bedroom, like I said. Uh, importantly, we have each house maintain at least three or four, depending on the size of the house, common area living spaces. Um, it's something that sets us apart as well as our peer bridgers um, that we'll talk about in a minute. but. Uh, a lot of transition homes, quote unquote, which they're called, which we are not. We are considered permanent supportive housing. Um, they they just jam three or four people in a room um, and everybody just uh, the one common area space they have is usually like an open floor plan where the kitchen, living and dining room are all one one area. We don't like that. We want people to be able to feel comfortable leaving their bedroom and use another part of the house and still have some privacy. So we'll have like a, um, it could be like there's a separate den. Uh, maybe we'll have one of the bedrooms be an actual den and then there'll be a separate computer room space, fully separated where you can close a door, have some privacy, work on your resume without everybody looking over your shoulder or asking you what you're doing. Um, there'll be a separate rec room. Um, separate living room people just can, where they can just escape and have their own little bit of privacy if they want to meet if they have a case manager especially if they have a peer bridger they can meet in privacy and uh, not feel like they have to stay in their rooms um in order to have and you know hold themselves up in their bedroom in order for them to have any privacy we are an evidence-based practice and um it's um the reason that we don't do any more than two people per room is we don't want to have any bunk beds, anything like that. It's too institutional. It's triggering to people that may have grown up in those types of instances and in those institutions or spent time in those institutions. So there's no bunk beds. There's no high density of people other than the two people. People get their own bed, their own chest of drawers, their own closet space, their own nightstands and reading lamps and so forth. Um, and we prefer two people per bedroom. Some houses will have single rooms if it's less than a pre uh, uh, exact size that we require of a bedroom. But we do prefer people sharing, uh, you know, two people per bedroom. It helps better in uh, the recovery, in recovering from the trauma and learning how to deal uh, more effectively rather than the flight or fight um, a typical uh, attitude that they typically are in when they're in homeless because when people are homeless they're just they develop habits on how do I survive out here how do I how do I try to make this meeting or go to that place to get food but yet all my stuff is here somebody's going to steal my stuff where do I sleep tonight where am I going to eat um, and we try to help people with the support of our peer bridgers um, and we try to help them kind of slowly but surely kind of get to a point where they're dealing with conflict and there's always going to be conflict, but they're dealing with it from a way of uh, less of the fight and flight and more on a recovery based culture. And that's kind of what our housing is referred to uh, is uh, it is recovery, uh, shared recovery housing. Um, and we want to have a culture of recovery in each house. And that's what the peer bridger is there for. Also to help people live as a single family would in a single family home. And Sarah will describe more about what uh, her peer bridgers do. And um, so that's about it. I think um, the differences that we have are number one, every house gets assigned, most importantly, a peer bridger. And our peer bridgers are, as Sarah will tell you, these are all people who have experienced the same traumas. 
Our peer bridgers uh, have all been homeless. They're recovering alcoholics, recovering addicts, incest survivors, domestic violence abuse survivors, people who may have been incarcerated that know how difficult it is to turn your life around when you're carrying the baggage of your past um, with you. Um, people living successfully with mental health challenges, uh, maybe such as bipolar disorder or, or whatever it may be. And a lot of the times you'll have all of these things that I just mentioned might be personified in one person. And um, what makes them effective is that they're models of recovery. They have all this in their past, but they've gone through it. They can talk the talk. They've been there. They've been in a tent. They've been addicted. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, beaten and abused maybe by a, by a partner. Uh, but at the same time, even in order to work, anybody that works at share has to be a model of recovery. And certainly our peer bridgers do that. They are that. And just by, uh, you know, being able to, as a peer, they're able to um, disclose their own shared living experiences where appropriate. And like I say, they're able to talk the talk. They develop trust uh, quickly um, um, and more effectively than uh, people do with uh, who they people they consider uh, outside authorities. Uh, like a case manager would be a case manager from a, a, an agency. Um, it, they typically are not a, they're not allowed actually to uh, disclose their shared, you know, their homelessness or addiction past or anything like that. Um, they are considered authority figures as well. So uh, our peer bridges are there to actually be a peer, someone who's been through the same situations for the most part, can share the same type of difficulties they went through. And even just by their uh, being a model of recovery, they're an inspiration, um, you know, and Sarah, who's on here to talk to, she's an inspiration for me. And I've been in recovery myself for uh, 14 and a half years. And, um, so I, I think that's the key and probably more attuned to this particular, uh, conference is our peer to peer work that we do with each individual that we move into these houses. Uh, last year, you'll see on your PowerPoint, we housed 456 people. We're slowly getting back to our pre pandemic, um, numbers, uh, for housing, which, uh, in, the year right before the pandemic hit, we housed uh, 615 people, and uh, we're getting back to that point right now, too. But on an average, we'll house close to 500 people a year, um, which is we are the only place in Los Angeles County that you can go to, which we can get you housed if everything fits uh, the same exact day. You can come to us. You can call us. We can outreach to you in the field um, at 11 o'clock in the morning and we can actually have you living in a really nice beautiful house you know by four o'clock that evening so um there's no place else in la county that you can do that which is why we're very popular with all the homeless services agencies throughout la county and with that um uh to me the best part of our program is our peer bridging so i want to introduce you to one of my favorite people of all time sarah she doesn't like it when I use her last name, but it's right there on the, uh, it says Sarah Gabriel right there. So please, everybody welcome Sarah. And I'm available for questions as well. I'm staying on here. So go ahead. Thank you so much, Tom. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah. It's really wonderful to meet you, e meet you. Um, I guess just to kind of give you a little bit of history about myself and how I fit into um, starting out as a peer bridger and peer support with Cher. Um, I'm a recovering addict, uh, and I experienced a ton of trauma as a child. Um, at 12 years old, um, I started using heavy drugs and continued to use heavy drugs until I was 38 years old. So I have a 26-year-long um, uh, addiction career. Um, during that time, I had a son, um, a lot of experiences with domestic violence with, with a couple different partners. Um, a lot of depression and, and mental health challenges and um, severe anxiety, debilitating anxiety, unable to leave the house or care for my son at some point, um, you know, and really finding myself in a tough spot and um, ended up being homeless for the last six years of that 26 year experience. Um, I ended up 
uh, living in my car for a couple years, and then I was just roaming the streets for a couple years, and then ended up in a tent uh, for those last two years. Um, and my story looks like any picture that you see on the news, any encampment that you drive by. Uh, we actually just found a picture of an article that they had done in the Los Angeles Times of me um, with this tarp of a tent and just surrounded by a bunch of trash and belongings and things that I had found, you know, in trash cans and dumpsters and outside of people's houses and um, just living in total despair. Um, you know, and the worst part was the self-hate and the self-abandon that I had experienced throughout all of those years and just missing my son terribly and not knowing where to start and how does your life get to this place and and more or less how do you how do you start over, you know, and um, I was given an opportunity, I met an outreach team with one of our local agencies um, and I had expressed how important it was to me to get treatment that I really needed some pretty severe help. Um, and I went into treatment and stayed there for the 90 days. <clears throat> I went into sober living and outpatient. I did an intensive outpatient for an additional six months. Um, and when my time was up there, I had I had reunited with my son. We were working on mending our relationship. I was deep, deep, deep into service and membership of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, absolutely uh, determined to turn my life around and and create a new future for my son and I um, with a lot of damage to clear up, a lot of issues to walk through and a lot of baggage to carry at that point. Um, I didn't have the credit score. I didn't have the rental history. I didn't have the references to get me into my own place. And a case manager that I had introduced me to um, uh, some teammates from Shared Collaborative Housing and I actually went into one of their new houses uh, out in like Crenshaw and Hyde Park. The house was actually built specifically for Share from the ground up. The homeowners had um, built this home and, you know, with the intention to be able to help people like myself that were looking for a new way of life and needing somewhere to call home. And so I moved into that place and um, utilized everything that it had to offer. Tom, was actually my peer bridger at that time. Um, this was four years ago, five, five years, four years ago, something like that, four and a half years ago. Um, my supervisor that I have now, she was also my peer bridger at that time. Um, with the support and help with what Cher was offering, I was able to have a, a beautiful, beautiful, safe home to live in. Um, you know, the support of other people that also had like minded goals. Something as simple as having a kitchen to cook in or a washer and dryer to do my laundry in or a bathroom to get back into the routine of hygiene, daily hygiene, um, a bed to make, dressers to fold my clothes in and put in a, a closet to hang my belongings in, like those things that um, I had felt uh, less than human because of, you know, not having for such a long time this domestic aspect to um, a life worth living uh, made such a difference. You know, I had got a little um, graveyard job at a local Amazon and was taking the bus and trying to provide for myself and my son to the best of our ability. And um, while I was in the process of, you know, finding some some stability for my son and I, that was, it was, and this is something that I express to residents all the time that, you know, somebody had made a comment about uh, permanent supportive housing. And, um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, one of our biggest goals is to be able to see people come in that didn't have the credit score, that didn't have the rental uh, references, that, um, you know, didn't have a, a long, a long longevity in their employment um, to be able to, like myself, like I came in and I started working on my credit immediately. I, I, they wouldn't even give me a bank account. I was like, I just want you guys to hold my money. And they were like, we don't want to touch your money, you know? So it was, uh, it was the process of, um, you know, what I needed, I won't go into full detail, but what I needed to do to start establishing um, some sort of stability within society is just as much in just as much as, as a, a bank account. Um, being able to make it to work on time, having a, a safe place to stay so that I could focus on my goals and appointments and things that I needed to do while I furthered my search for stability for my son and I, who at that time was 16. Um, and so, 
uh, being in a share house allotted me the opportunity to really get back on my feet and I took full opportunity of it. Um, I was there for a few months. My son and I um, went into a different program where we were, we, uh, I'll just say that we continued our healing journey, right? And, and I just continued to climb that ladder. I actually I had started going to school for another profession and I realized that um, it wasn't really the thing that was suiting me and I had remembered seeing a flyer at one of our share houses about the peer support specialist training and I remember talking to Tom about it you know months and months ago um, prior to this and he you know recommending Sarah I think you would be a really good candidate for that because you have so much lived experience and that's what this is all about and at that time not feeling like I was worthy of something like that that my life was you know, too much in shambles still to be able to offer anybody anything else. Um, and so, you know, a year or so later, when I had revisited the idea of becoming a peer support specialist, um, it just so happened that the next cohort was starting, I think, within the next couple weeks, and I registered for it and got approved. And um, it was honestly a life changing experience to be able to sit in Libby's trainings and feel that identification of all of these experiences that I had, all of these life experiences, you know, some um, by my own accord and my own choice and some not right? Like there's a lot of things that people experience that lead them into a place of addiction or dereliction or homelessness um, that stems from deep rooted trauma. And it stems from, from deep disconnection from having people in your life that you can trust or help um, guide you in the right direction. And so to be able to sit uh, in this training and, and really learn about the ins and the outs of, of character and of experience and other people's traumas and other people's journeys and the tools that we use to help support other people in that process. Like I knew that I had found my spot, right? Like all of those boxes that I checked off of all of the ways that had been seen as, you know, deficits throughout my life. Um, had now become assets because not only did I have the lived experience of what that feels like on a cellular level to experience something like the things that I had experienced, but I had also begun walking through the recovery process of that. And I, I became a vision of hope for other people on um, how do we get out and how do we stay out? And not only that, but how do we thrive? And so upon uh, completing the peer support specialist training um I think it was the same day that I took the final, the way that the timing worked out was just crazy. It was like the same day that I took the final happened to be the day that they were doing a, a job fair for openings here at SHARE. And so I was encouraged to go apply and, um, you know, still battling with a ton of self-doubt, but surrounded by people that, um, you know, fan my flame. And that's what SHARE does. We fan the flame of people's insecurities and self-doubts and, and, and there was so much encouragement and I had the willingness to put one foot in front of the other. And so, um, you know, I took initiative and went through the application process and was, to my surprise, hired rather quickly as a peer bridger, um, you know, and it, it was such an incredible experience to be able to use, um, like I said, all of those things that I had kind of seen as a, as a crutch or a handicap or a disability mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, and all of the ways that I, you know, had been a thorn in my side or, or a fire along the path or a dumpster fire in general, um, were now, uh, this, this, uh, this tool and this superpower to be able to connect with other people that, that also felt extremely alone and maybe had lost hope. Um, as a peer bridger, we have the opportunity to, uh, come in. We, we minimize authority. That's one of our tools, minimizing authority. We're just coming in as peer to peer. Um, we're not there to tell you what your problem is and what we think you should do about it or uh, insist or initiate where we think a person should be. It's more or less like, uh, what do you think your problem is and how can I help? Um, and being able to guide people through our lived experience. So, you know, part of my lived experience is getting my teeth fixed, having the handful of teeth that I had left pulled and, you know, walk into the acceptance of getting dentures at a very young age. I was 38 years old when I got dentures, um, but wanting my smile back, you know, and how important that was to me. And there's been a few different people that I've got to walk 
alongside with that journey. And that's a really big deal. Um, helping people walk through the steps of what they need to do to work on their credit. I came in with a credit score of like 350 or something unmentionable like that. And I'm in like the 760s now. Um, you know, I kept my clean date from the day that I, I went into treatment. Um, well, the day after, because I had used that morning that I went into treatment. So January 19th, 2018, like, like I've, I've kept that clean date the entire time and walked through the process of recovery where, um, you know, I sponsor other women and I, I speak at, at different events and um, get to be kind of a watchtower for other people that are entering into this journey. Um, and, and those are incredible tools that all of our peer bridgers have access to because they've walked that path there it's it's one of the requirements for share uh, employees is to not only have had the lived experience and the experience of walking through the recovery process but that we're doing that currently that it's a current uh, it's a current exploration. It's a current commitment that we're currently going to our self-help support groups, that we're currently working the steps if we're part of a 12-step fellowship or working with a sponsor or being of service to others. Um, it's really important that, you know, we're able to walk the walk with our residents, um, you know, because a lot of people are coming from places of distrust or disconnection. Um, and who better to be able to guide them and love them along that journey than somebody that understands what that feels like and and the humiliation and the embarrassment and the shame and the fear and the self-doubt um and uh you know it's been a real honor being able to also support the people that we work with because we're just regular folks in recovery ourselves. you know we're not we don't have letters after our first and last names we're not um, we become specialists in a lot of ways because of the experiences that we share, um, but by no means, you know, have we gone to, you know, extensive, some of us may have gone to universities, but it's it's not this extensive, you know, college training, it's lived experience. And um, being able to see uh, the light turn on in people's eyes again, being able to see the hope and this vision that people have all of a sudden when we sit down and we do a plan for success with them. And and in the very beginning, you know, it becomes this challenge of like, well, I've really never looked outside of, of just surviving today. I, I'm not sure what it is that I want to do. I don't know if I have what it takes to, to you know, get, get my own place someday. And being able to uh, encourage people through that process of you know, what are your goals? Where do you see yourself in five years from now? What would you need to do in four years in order to make that five-year goal happen? What would you need to do in three years in order to make that four-year goal happen? And to bring it down all the way from, you know, a year to six months, to three months, to two months, to two weeks, to today, like, what are we doing today to get towards that five-year goal? Um, you know, and we have an opportunity to watch people reunite with their families, to get new jobs, to work on health concerns that they've been avoiding and neglecting for a very long time, to get connected to mental health providers so that they can have some sort of regimen and someone to talk to on a professional level, um, you know, to become, and this is a really important factor for a lot of people, to be able to have that diagnosis and medical care. Um, for things that they've been suffering in in silence for the majority of their lives, not being able to identify what that thing is and being able to have the structure and stability of some professional help. Um, you know, people being able to join in in a community. We have people that come into the house. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to deal with anybody. I'm just here. I just want to have a roof over my head. I'm not interested in making new friends. And then watch those people slowly, um, you know, uh, really participate in the community of the home. We They're watching TV shows together weekly. They're going to the grocery store as, as a unit and they're shopping for groceries collectively to go back and cook a meal that they're all gonna enjoy together. Like, um, you know, maybe they're, they're going to self-help support groups themselves now. Um, they're helping each other around the house. People start, you know, taking enjoyment and being able to have a home to care for. There's just, the the benefits are endless. Um, people getting their driver's licenses, people getting their records cleaned up, um, you know, like I said, not, you know, people not having uh, rental references, they have an opportunity with the homeowner or the landlord or property manager um, to, you know, they're paying their rent on time every single month and it's affordable rent, it's 550 or it's 675, it's affordable rent and it's manageable. Um, 
and it shows consistency. And at the, you know, a year and a half, two years down the road, when they've worked on their credit and they have a stable job that they've kept for the last two years and they, they have some character references and the homeowner is able to, you know, create an affidavit of, of um, responsibility and their payments. And that goes towards the next place that they're trying to apply to. And we watch people get their own apartments, um, market rate housing apartments on their own. Um, you know, getting a car note, there's just people traveling, like, um, it's really incredible to watch people make the most of what Share Collaborative has to offer. And sometimes we have some people um, that are just there because they really like living with other people, they don't want to live alone, or maybe they're on a fixed income. And, um, you know, they're in their, their, their wiser years. And um, they feel a little bit safer being in a community of other people where they're not you know, left, left kind of solo on their own, isolated in, in an SRO somewhere or something. Um, and in regards to the, the question about, you know, this, the permanent supportive housing, um, all that means is that um, they're welcome to stay there, you know, as long as they're willing and able to pay the rent and they're willing and able to care for themselves and participate in, in caring for the home. And, um, you know, there's no time limit that somebody can be there. We've had people that have lived in the houses for 10, 15 years. Um, and maybe I can think of one woman in particular, the house that she was in did happen to close down. Um, I think the homeowner was going to be selling it and we were able to relocate her to another home. She loved, you know, being in share so much that she wanted to stay in the share community. Um, yeah, there's just, there's, there's really endless opportunities for the, you know, each individual and, and whatever willingness and cooperation that they individually bring to the table. Um, I was able to expand into supervision, which was, um, you know, an honor. It's, I've been with Share Collaborative Housing for three, a little over three years. Um, I've been clean for a little over five years. The relationship with my son and I, our stability, we're just regular folks in society. Um, and if I didn't tell people my story, most people would never guess, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the stability that Share Collaborative Housing offered me in the very beginning, the support that I had from Tom and Maria. Um, you know, it's one thing for people you know, we hear in the rooms, uh, we'll love you till you learn how to love yourself. And what Share Collaborative Housing really does is we believe in people while they're in the process of believing in themselves. Um, and, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of interest and it takes a lot of trust on our residents part um, and a lot of diligence and hard work from our peer bridgers. Um, they're out there every single day dealing with anything from, you know, so-and-so keeps using my rosemary and I've had enough of it, you know, or uh, or maybe somebody's going through some um, real serious life changes and they need a lot of extra attention. And sometimes the peer bridgers and the people at the house are the only family that our residents have left um, or the only family that they're, you know, that they're the only people they consider family that they're um, engaging in. Um, we're able to help people work through their goals, work through their traumas, connect them to self-help support groups. A big part of what we do as peer bridgers is connecting them to resources throughout the community. Our belief in connecting them to self-help support groups is so they have a water, a, a broader uh, foundation of people that they can connect to with more people with more experience, um, you know, and really getting them connected to resources throughout the community so that they can learn how to be self-sufficient. It's not about doing things for them. Um, it's about helping them learn how to do for themselves. So I think you, Sarah. that that yeah. kind of wraps it up. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate sure. it. Um, I wanted just to kind of summarize before we close. Um, as Sarah said, there are certain things that Cher believes in, and we're dealing with population of people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we believe that the opposite of homelessness is uh, wholeness and connection. Um, and we're trying to create, as Sarah said, these self-supporting uh, social structures, tangible social support. And as evidence shows, 40% of mental health illness is because of a lack of tangible social support. Um, again, homelessness, it's our belief that homelessness, we don't actually like to use the word the homeless or you know, as a block of people, all monolithic. Homelessness, in our view, is just one part of a person, the whole arc of a person's life. There was life before they were homeless. There's going to be life after they're homeless. And this is just one period of time. Um, 
Um, trauma can be healed uh, as evidence has shown by people helping people in a participant centered model. That's one of our biggest beliefs. That's why we have the peers, um, peer to peer social support, as Sarah was saying. Um, and we also believe that every homeless person not only uh, has a place back in society, but they deserve a place back in society doing all the things that Sarah uh, was talking about. One of my favorite things is when Sarah and I are in some of these agency meetings, especially in the areas where um, so, uh, uh, outreach workers were always trying to you know, connect with Sarah when she was homeless. And uh, literally people have pulled off to the side of the road saying, that's Sarah. That is not Sarah Gabriel. She cursed at me, told me to go away, whatever the entire time she was in that homeless camp. And that's an example of uh, what we have. A couple of success stories. I will say one thing everybody remembers. I talk about this thing called uh, every homeowner can also choose uh, if they have a passion for a population, whether they want to house people identifying as LGBTQ or um, veterans or whatever, whatever it is, if they have a specific population. We have this one house that we, uh, the landlord wanted it to be for middle aged and older women, which is a very growing homeless population right now. Uh, for instance, a caregiver, a, fee, uh, a woman who's taking care as an in home caregiver, uh, if the person she's caring for dies, they lose their income and their housing on the same day. Um, we have a house that was kind of dedicated to that. And these six women, it's been very, very successful. I call it the Golden Girls. They're all in their 60s. Um, but they are the family that they do not have. Uh, they've been disconnected from, you know, they wake up, they shop, who's going to shop, who's going to cook. There's arguments, there's everything like you would have in any family, but they help support each other uh, uh, so much. It, it's very emotional to me. And we've always called it the golden girls house. Um, and we have other houses like that as well. Um, a couple of really quick success stories that I like to talk about. One is a woman that I found in a um, riverbed in Southgate. We got her house. She was a, completely abused and, and uh, beaten by um, her domestic partner. Got her into share collaborative housing. Um, took her a little while. I connected her with an agency to pay her rent for a little while. Um, but I, we realized she also had some talent. Her dream was to work for Cher one day and kind of like Sarah and um, got her into this home to employment program that I was telling you about. Uh, she lived in the house for nine months. Uh, she did really well. We we hired her after a couple of uh, uh, she did a couple of uh, volunteer intern programs with us. I had her out on Venice Beach when we did the outreach there and she became very successful in doing outreach all throughout L L.A. County in all of our contracts and moved into her own little apartment, uh, one bedroom apartment. And uh, from there now she's actually working for a different agency, but uh, it's been a big success story. A shorter version of that would be in that same program, we housed a guy from a riverbed in um, Coyote Creek, which is out in Santa Fe Springs, literally living in a tent next to the river. And um, he did, he just couldn't get a job. He had job experience in his past, the perfect guy we were looking for. We housed him in one of our houses in Paramount not far from where he was homeless, which is key, got him into the home to employment program. Within the first two weeks, he got a job making $18.50 an hour at a warehouse right there by where he was living. And then a supervisor noticed that he was really effective at his job. He started talking to him, realized this guy had some management experience in his past and uh, asked him if he wanted to get in a management training program. He said, yes. So this guy is now working at a job that pays him $75,500 a year. And literally in January, he was in a tent with no money, not even GR, couldn't even if we had to pitch in and get him food, send him to food banks and so forth. And now he's actually in the house and he just offered a new resident a job at his warehouse, a guy that just came in from off the streets too. So uh, we have all kinds of success stories, as Sarah was saying, and Thank you for participating and this is awesome. Don't forget, I put the uh, PowerPoint with you, a, lo a lot more details and so forth. Um, if you want to feel free to have it. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I think we're coming toward the end. <clears throat> Billy, are we supposed to end it? One at a time, are we supposed to end this? We are actually good until. Um... 11.45. Oh, I thought it was 75 minutes. It is 75 minutes. Oh, we started okay, at good. 10.30. Oh, okay. I was thinking, oh, that's only 45 minutes. Right. Okay, good. Um, so does anybody, um, 
have any other questions for us about what our peer bridgers do, um, I, I did want to say, uh, kind of go over exactly what a peer bridger does when one person moves, when a new person moves comes in from the house from uh, living on the street and moves into a house. And usually uh, our, our goal is to try within the first uh, couple of days, two to three days, make sure that uh, the peer bridger who's assigned to that house meets with them. And Sarah, do you want to explain exactly what they do, um, what the peer bridger does and trying to get a plan for success in place with them and so forth in writing? Sure. So um, upon meeting, you know, we're a housing first model. So one of the things that, um, what, what that means is that uh, the, sorry, I've got three things going on right now. Um, that they, you know, like Tom was saying, will connect with another agency, or maybe they call the the um, one eight seven seven line, and we get them into a house prior to you know having to do any paperwork or anything like that. So when they do get moved in, uh, within the first forty eight hours, our peer bridger goes out and meets with them, and we have a welcome packet that we do. Um, within that welcome packet is the plan for success. Um, and I kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but but really what that does, and I'll you know I'll use my lived experience. This is kind of how you know it works. Is that when um when they sat down with me and they asked me to to look at goals over the next five years, it was, um, I mean to say challenging, uh, really minimizes what that felt like. Like I felt defeated just trying to think about what five years would look like. Um, I hadn't. I hadn't thought about my future in in many many years. Like really, really sat down and thought about it, you know. Um, and it's an exercise that I, you know, it's one of those things. I think if 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 we take away something's job, it stops working. And and having visions and having goals is a muscle that needs exercise, just like any other part of our body. And um, you know, the act of thinking about what do I really want? Is it possible with no ceilings or no boxes or or no limitations, like what does success look like to me on an emotional level, on a mental level, on a spiritual level, on a physical level? Uh, does does it include reunification with my family? Does it include going back to school? Does it include something happening with my health? Like, what does a vision of success look for me? And so look like for me. And so, um, you know, some people, it's it's easier for them to look at, I'm going to look at the big, big goal five years from now, right? So I'll just use an example. Um, you know, I'd like to, I think mine at five years was I'd like to have my own apartment and I'd like to own a car um, to have reunification with my family and had been going back to school. And so um, I was able to put the long-term goals there at the five years and, and we sit with people and whatever works, you know, not everybody's mind works the same way. Not everybody's flow is, is similar in that way. And so um, whether it's looking at today, what am I doing today to work towards those goals? Well, today I'm sitting down with my peer bridger doing this paperwork and exploring goals. Um, what could I do in the next two days? Well, I could start, um, I could start looking at, uh, self-help support groups in my area so I can get connected to the 12-step fellowship in the in the area that I moved to. Um, and, and it really, what it does is it starts like, um, it starts giving everyone an opportunity to expand on what do we wanna do with our time? What do we wanna do with our days? So that we're not just kind of ho-humming around the house and, and um, you know, mis misusing time. It's, it, it gives people an opportunity to start kind of getting those wheels moving as far as um, what would I like to do in one week? Well, maybe the responsible thing to do would be uh, look through a, a employment application or employment website and kind of see what jobs are out there and get an idea of some of the things that I'm interested in, see if anything catches my eye. And then within the next couple of weeks, I'd like to be able to um, start working on an, a resume, start looking at a resume. I hadn't had a resume in a gazillion years. I didn't work for 13 years. Um, the jobs that I had worked prior to that, I'd be lucky to remember what city they were in. And if I had even been there for more than three or four months, I didn't have a whole lot to work with. Right. And so we get to sit down with people and, and look at like, well, what were some of the things that you were doing? What are some of the things that were happening throughout your life that we could put down as life skills? Um, what are the, some of the connections that you have to community? We can get them connected to like Chrysalis or certain Job Corps um, 
uh, employment agencies, things like that, that have specialists that will help with the resume. Um, and then, you know, looking at how do we uh, start having the courage to turn in applications um, and then really start building on that. I'd like to start a savings account. I would like to start putting money towards this. I'd like to start working on my credit, whatever that ultimate goal was. And what are the steps that we need to take in order to get to that goal? Um, and it, and, and it changes, right? Because some of us have very small self-esteems and lack total confidence. Um, and so being able to, uh, there's this small voice that happens inside of people that are like, yeah, I'd really like to do this. I just, you know, I don't think it's going to happen for somebody like me. Or, you know, as long as I'm involved, there's a really good chance it's going to get messed up. And so people keep their their goals and their visions very, very small. And so, you know, after being there for six months and kind of getting to see um, them establish their roots within the community or start meeting smaller goals and their confidence starts to build and they're, you know, uh, participating in esteemable acts in their daily life, which is building their self-esteem, uh, that vision begins to, uh, to get a little bit brighter and a little bit broader. And so we get to revisit that. We try to revisit it once a year and and redo that plan for success because, you know, hopefully and often things have changed um, at that point. And it's, it's so cool to be able to see people reach those goals, not only have the courage to set a goal, but to take the initiative and the steps to reach that goal and then to manifest that into an actual part of their experience. Um, and there's other things, you know, we have the ultimate question, which is a really important part of the welcome packet that we use with our residents. And it's great when there's conflict in the house, it's, it's is saying or doing A, B or C going to help bring us closer together or push us further apart. And then we'll have a list, there is a list of, um, you know, behaviors and mannerisms that create connection and then behaviors and mannerisms that create disconnection and cause pain. And, and we're able to kind of sit because the social skills or the ability to communicate or um, crisis management, those things are usually pretty low on the list as far as capabilities, uh, you know, when coming off the streets or incarceration or, um, you know, drug addiction, domestic violence, any of those situations. Um, so yeah, does that, I probably went a little left field, but <laughs> yeah, that kind of help. does that kind of help explain the plan for success a little better? Yeah, I think that's great, yeah. Sarah. <laughs> what about when uh, there's conflict, uh, when you have a lot of people from all the different backgrounds that don't know each other and they're kind of uh, find themselves all together, you know, living with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And obviously there's going to be conflict. Um how do what's the way that a, a share peer bridger deals with uh conflict you know trying to make sure everybody has a voice or gets heard um do you have house meetings or how do you how, what's the approach to that to make sure everybody's not uh you know everybody's you know trying to uh live together as opposed as you said get farther apart <clears throat> right um so it's kind of a case by case basis, right? Depending on the willingness or the cooperation or the temperament of people. Um, generally, you know, we like to talk to people individually and give them the time and space to um, share what's going on and just vent freely. Um, one of our tools is joining the person. And that's where, you know, meeting a person where they're at is really important, where you're not telling them that they're right and you're not telling them that you're wrong, but you're letting them know that you're there with them and that you hear them. And so sometimes, you know, those conversations can be like, um, I can understand why that would be really, really important to you, or it makes sense to me why that would upset you so much, or, um, you know, I can understand where you're coming on, I can understand where you're coming from on that, I can see that that really, that that really um, insulted you, where I'm just reiterating back to them what they're telling me, um, without any judgment, without co-signing it, without creating any other images of whatever is going on on the outside of it and just kind of joining that person and validating them. Um, and then we go into a space of, you know, well, I wonder if it's kind of like a motivational interviewing tactic, right? Like, like, I wonder what would happen if we considered it like this, or I wonder what the other person's experience was in that. And we kind of get like the curiosity wheels turning, right? Um, to get them out of self um, if they're willing. And then we do have house meetings 
um, where everybody has an opportunity to kind of speak their piece. And the goal is to get into a solution. We do problem solving. We look at all of the different ways, all of the different ideas that everybody has of how we can how we can uh, find a solution to whatever the conflict is. Um, and sometimes it's a personality conflict. Sometimes it's transference where, you know, a certain individual reminds them of someone that they experienced trauma with. And there's just something about them that triggers them every single time they're in the same room together. The moment that they wake up and hear their voice, they're just already in an aggravated mood. Um, so we always want to try to connect people to self-help support groups, to, um, you know, the therapeutic value of one person that's been in that experience helping another um, is unmatched, and we always want to make sure to help expand their social circle in that way. Um, we use the plan for success in that measure too. Is it's like, is this is and I and the, I can use my experience on this one. There was some stuff going on in the house that I lived in, um, and and as far as my goals were, and this was kind of the approach is like. Is it more important for me to get involved with this and spend all of this energy feeling some type of way about somebody else's problem or would I like to stay in my own lane and focus my energy on my goals and keep, you know, keep moving forward till that vision of, of what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. And so we use that plan for success of like, um, how does this fit into your ultimate goal? How does, you know, continually fighting with this person over here day in and day out, is that a distraction keeping you away from being able to focus on your goal or is it helping guide you on that journey to that thing that's really really important to you and a lot of times people will realize like this is petty and insignificant and I just I want to focus on myself and just get better and like get the heck out of here or get my own place or I'd really like to be able to get along with her again or um you know and and often enough like people work things out amongst each other and themselves it's not really our place to like, like I said, minimize authority is a really important part of our tools. It's not our place to go in and tell people who's wrong and who's right and how they need to act. Um, it's more like investigating feelings and solutions and having them come up with their own ideas, having them come up with their guidelines to the house, um, how they want to function around each other. If that's like a laundry schedule, a TV schedule, uh, you know, when the TV gets turned down at a certain time of night, like there's the resident council, they come together and make those those decisions amongst each other. And the purpose for that and the benefit is that is that they help hold each other accountable. It's not like I created the boundary because I said it needs to happen. They created the boundary because they agreed it was a need amongst each other. Um, and so it kind of gives them the autonomy to have, you know, to be self-supporting in that way. Um, yeah, and we're not, I mean, we're not magicians and we're not, <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes it works better than others. And sometimes people are very adamant on not get, you know, the challenge is, is that we deal with, uh, we work with a lot of people that have extreme, that come from extreme trauma and that it's unresolved and undiagnosed. Um, it's, it's misplaced often. Um, there's this, you know, raging thing that's going on inside of them and everybody is going to pay for it. Um, this unmanageability, right, that we talk about this inward or outward unmanageability. And so a lot of times it's just being there for the person, building capital, um, being able to just hear them and listen and remind them that they're important. Um, and again, connect them as often as possible to self-help support groups where they get to hear multiple people's experience and multiple people's solutions and multiple people's journey through recovery of that same exact thing that they're suffering from. Um, yeah, and that's the best that we can hope for is that somebody will just allow us to join them as we disclose our own personal experience and how self-help support groups have helped us in numerous ways, encourage them to have some sort of um some sort of you know self-sufficiency within their life where they have a sense of accomplishment or they feel like they're taking accountability for their choices and it kind of builds their esteem so it's a process it's a long process yeah thank you um sarah um to that point one of our major funders is la county department of mental health like i said we have a lot of different funders for our shared collaborative housing program politicians uh etc but um one thing that Sarah mentioned is we're housing people uh, sometimes which are 
we would call them higher, uh, the homeless services uh, industry, if you will, would call them high acuity people. These are high priority people to get into housing and get off the streets uh, because they have their, uh, they have more severe mental health illness and substance abuse, et cetera. And um, we also are, are housing them with other people that would be considered lower acuity who don't have they do have the trauma, but they're not as uh, severe. And so they're, you know, taking steps to uh, transform their lives as well and getting them to uh, live together in a cohesive plan. And not only just living together, but to support each other um, is a big challenge. And it's one thing that our peer bridgers do really well. There's one statistic that we maintain, and it's in the, the um, PowerPoint uh, in the chat um pretty uh consistently and it's that 26 percent of our residents with uh smi which basically stands for severe mental illness uh they get jobs uh, when they move into our housing they get jobs within one year and maintain their own housing as a matter of fact overall 95 percent of the people and this is almost right on it only varies by uh, a couple of tenths of a percentage point every year 95% of the people that we house and share collaborative housing maintain their housing um, either in share uh, or maybe we move them to another share house or even better, maybe we move them into their own apartment or some other form of housing. And um, there is, uh, as Sarah reminded me, you know, one thing that I talked to uh, all of our brand new homeowner partners about <clears throat> just to kind of prepare them, you know, a little bit without scaring them is um, that's a good question. Donald, I'll answer that in a second is uh, we have these four stages. It's actually the four stages of any group conscience, and it's called forming, storming, norming and performing. And in the beginning, you have the forming stage. People are moving in. I call it they have their church clothes on, you know. They want to make a good impression on the landlord, on the new roommates, uh, on the peer bridge or whatever. Or at least you would hope at that point that's what they're trying to do. And then um, uh, after not too long of a period of time, then people will start to, you know, they're still in their fight or flight mode. Sometimes it's fight, sometimes it's flight. People who like to kind of dominate others will uh, start to do that. And people who will have a habit of allowing people to dominate uh, uh, them will also start to, you know, behave like that. So then we get into the storming uh, phase and that's where the peer bridger is really essential at a brand new house. Uh, that's where they spend a lot of their time. Um, uh, like Sarah said, having house meetings, conflict resolution, making sure everybody gets uh, their own voice heard. Nobody's getting bullied, um, getting people to support each other. And then eventually it gets to a norming phase, normalizing. Okay, now we're stable. Uh, we're, we're having less uh, you know, uh, conflicts being acted out uh, consistently in here. So, uh, and then after that phase, that's when we get into the uh, performing phase. And that's where people uh, get jobs. They, they achieve their own rent self-sufficiency in some way. Um, and that's where all the success stories come out of. And sometimes this can happen in a very short period of time, all four of those uh, stages. And other times it takes it takes a while to get out of the uh, the uh, storming phase. But but that's our goal for each house. And um, in response, Donald, to how do people uh, give up their houses to rent? These some of them are large landlords. Um, yes. Um, uh, and some of them are just mom and pop. They just have one rental property. Um, it basically, uh, we will connect them to other homeowners. Uh, we will, uh, who have uh, houses with us and they can share their stories with them. Um, it, it's usually people that are, the people that are successful are not just trying to get the more dollar thinking that, oh, uh, it's a, I have a four bedroom house. I can get this if I rent it to a, a couple and I can get this much more because I have eight people in your program, if they're just looking at it on a financial basis, they think they're going to get more rent. It's not going to work. They have to, number one, we look for people that really want to do something for this population, really want to do something for their community. And number two, it is our job to make sure there's a positive cash flow uh, every month. Uh, it has to make sense financially, but if they're only looking for, they can get more rent because they've got eight people instead of two, it, it usually doesn't work. And I, I have long uh talks with them and i introduce them to other landlords and so forth before they open the house to us 
Um, ADUs are great. They're very popular in LA. City of LA actually has a program to encourage that. Um, our experience with ADUs is typically an ADU in Los Angeles County, Donald, can only be 1,200 square feet, which is typically usually like a max of uh, two bedrooms. Um, we don't do anything less than a three bedroom house. Um, it's not worth it for share to provide peer bridgers for anything less than six people. So, so what we would do is we have homeowners that have come to us that live in a nice, you know, a nice size house, maybe a four, five, six bedroom house uh, up on the street. And in the back of the property, they'll build an ADU. Maybe a couple is empty nesting. All their kids have gone, grown up and gone away, but they still like to live in that neighborhood. So they'll build themselves like a 1200 square foot ADU in the back uh, or however big, you know, it can accommodate uh, no more than that. And so they'll move into the back. They won't, it's not attached to the property. Uh, they'll live independently and, and they'll give us the house for share collaborative housing up front. So, um, but I did want to state that, yeah, we, we sometimes what's actually worked pretty well is we've had a couple of homeowners that have, ADUs in the back where they've also provided, they don't live in it, but it's kind of an incentive. They rent it out. It might be a one or two bedroom, which doesn't fit the share model, but somebody that might want to quote unquote graduate, they get a job or whatever, and they kind of want to move out of the big house and they can move, they can rent out the small ADU or have their own bedroom in an ADU in a two bedroom ADU in the back of the house. And that's been successful as well. So Yes, we're amenable to the ADU program, um, but again, we basically focus on, we have regulations also that I didn't want to really get into, but, you know, no more than six people can share a bathroom, um, uh, things like that, you know, X amount of refrigerators for X amount of people that you have each, you know, every four people that you have in the house and so forth. So typically the ADUs are too small for the share collaborative housing program, but if they're bigger in Marin County, um, then you, yes, of course. So um, that's a great question, though, because that's a popular program down here. Um, any other, were there any other questions? That's a really good question, actually. <clears throat> oh, we do have large landlords. Uh, we have uh, a couple of landlords that have houses with us that may have like 1,500 apartment units, uh, but they decide they do have uh, some rental houses and they've decided to give us a try. We have one that's one of the largest property owners in all of LA County that would fall into that category. And they have uh, they have three single family houses in shared collaborative housing with us. And that's a good um, that's a good landlord for us because typically they will take people uh, and kind of reduce the requirements for their apartments that they normally would require based on how somebody has performed in their shared collaborative house. So uh, yeah, those landlords are equally as welcome with us as are the, uh, what I would call the mom and pop homeowner. <clears throat> Anybody else? I think, I think, uh, Billy, I think if nobody else has any questions, Sarah, is there anything else you wanted to say in closing? No, oh, you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> Thank you so much. You think after three years of doing this, we'd know what I we're know. doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for your time and attention and interest. Um, if you have any further questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to myself. My email is sarah at shareselfhelp.org. I can put that in the chat. Yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. Um, I'll put my email and my phone number in the chat for you guys. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> reminding me to do that. Of course. Any last minute comments or any last minute comments or questions? Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much to everyone. We're grateful that uh, we get to share this space with you. Yes, and really. Thank you for your presentation, both of you. Thanks, Billy. Thanks for helping out, buddy. Mm -hmm.
Thanks. And uh, yeah, before you go, I want to, I'm just finishing up typing Sarah's uh, email in. Here. Oh, I put it in there. Oh, you did? Great. Yeah, okay. I put mine in. And then there's mine. Feel free if you have any other questions. If you know anybody that uh, might be interested in uh, opening a house with us um, or um, anybody that needs to get housed, uh, we deal with all, all of LA County. Um, so just feel free to call me or email Sarah or me, whichever you want to do, and we'll be happy to be here for you, be of service to you. Thank you again for uh, joining us. Really appreciate it and spending your time with us. It's been a pleasure.